first, how did you, um, how did you come to the idea even of mindful journalism? There's not a lot written about it. No. And what gave you the idea? Okay. Well, it, it really um, bubbled to the surface over a number of years. Um, I mean, many years ago as an undergraduate student, I um, encountered uh, Buddhism and Hinduism as part of my undergraduate studies into Indian history and actually went to India and um, uh, traveled through there for uh, a few months. Um, and sort of dabbled in and out of um, that area, those philosophies over my life. It was more um, in recent years when I was actually Australia's correspondent for Reporters Without Borders and doing talks about, um, you know, changing media, uh, difficulties journalists are facing internationally and the changing nature of news. And it was uh, an address I gave at the Auckland University of Technology, where I cited the work of my colleague, Shelton Gunaratni, who had gone very deeply into uh, the application of Buddhist phenomenology to journalism. Um, and I said, well, perhaps there is a scope for a more mindful journalism uh, than we have today. And that seemed to strike a chord. People started asking me, what do you mean by mindful journalism? And that was only in 2013. Uh, so as well as my media law work, um, I've been exploring that area. And uh, a major part of that was the kind invitation uh, from Shelton Gunaratni uh, to join him and another scholar in the editing of the book uh, called Mindful Journalism with Routledge uh, a couple of years ago, where um, I contributed a few chapters. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, that particular book um, goes very deeply into Buddhist phenomenology, which is really Shelton's um, expertise. It's not something that I know a great deal about. I uh -huh. describe myself as a secular Buddhist. And uh, uh -huh. what I mean by that is that um, I see um, all sorts of applications for just some of the fundamental principles in one's life. Um, but for journalism at a, at a secular level, level. So I just think that um, something like the Eightfold Path, um, which is foundational to Buddhism, um, as are the Four Noble Truths, I think they actually offer a secular lens uh, through which we can view our ethical behaviour uh, as individuals and as journalists. Uh -huh. um so has your has your journey in in the discovering sort of mindful journalism uh, has it affected how you consume the news? Uh, very much and, so, very and much I'm so. About because what, what uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because how, how do you, yeah, how are you uh, actually, um, I I consciously I don't know. Sometimes there are waves of these um, experiences or phenomena that are felt more bro broadly throughout society and you you think of it personally as a change in your own behaviour when maybe there are many, many other people out there doing the same thing. But um, I found working with those principles over a few years has meant that I really um, reject um, gossip, celebrity news. I resist the urge to look at them. And um, I turn the television off when there is just continuous stream of uh, news of car accidents, crimes, um, things like that. Not that the community doesn't need to know about some of these things, but quite often the way they are reported actually offers no real solution and in many ways may well be increasing people's suffering or angst, uh, stress in their lives, and giving them the false impression that some of these events are happening a lot more often than they really are. Yes, yes. I think we've known that in journalism for a long time, that um, people commonly conceive, for example, that crime rates are far, far higher than they actually are based on, based on news reporting. Um, so uh, it's interesting, and I want to talk more about pedagogy in a moment, but um, just sticking with, with news now, it's just, it's really interesting because we're really inundated, uh, particularly now under this administration, with um, divisive and, and polarized news. And it's funny because in one chapter of your book, you talk about the, the about truth as one of the fundamentals of mindfulness. Um, 
And in some ways we seem farther than ever from that in, you know, we talk about a post-truth world now. Um, And in other ways, I feel like we talk more about mindfulness than we ever have. Uh, There seem to be, uh, you know, when I mentioned this project to people, um, I got far more of a, um, a far more of an open response than I expected. And so those two things really seem to be at, at odds. Uh, is this, is it a really big barrier, do you think, to this profession or where, where are we now? Or do you, do you have any sense of where we are in the trajectory of going toward mindfulness in our profession? Well, uh, I have a sense or I have a hope, uh, but a lot of what we talk about here, in fact, the whole domain of journalism ethics, I suppose, um, it's it's often very idealistic and aspirational because uh, yeah. it's one thing to talk about what might be, and it's quite another, um, say, for a young graduate to be dealing with the um, time and resource pressures of a mainstream newsroom uh, in yes. the midst of 24-7 news flow when they are actually quite lucky to even have the job in the industry. So so um, it, it's wonderful sitting in, uh, in one what some might call an ivory tower of an academic institution and uh, yes. viewing these things. But nevertheless, um, we can work uh, in, in small steps and at the margins. And so my hope is that my own students, when they graduate, um, uh, coming to your point about mindfulness and um, the application of that to journalism, um, I say in most of my writing that I'm not expecting um, journalists to stop work suddenly and take up the lotus position uh, in the newsroom in the midst of a major story. But um, it, it's not greatly different from what educationalists have been telling us for many years. And um, the great professional educator Donald Schoen uh, and his writings in the late 80s talked about the process process of of learning, which encourages what's called a reflection in action, uh, reflective practice. And the, um, I guess, the optimal tertiary uh, education in journalism would be one where you can be quite comfortable that your students, when encountered with new situations and um, ethical dilemmas, will be able to pause to reflect upon uh, their practices and their, um, you know, hopefully prior to uh, engaging in whatever the behaviour is and thinking through the implications of that. And I think mindfulness isn't far away from that notion of reflection in action. I I think with full meditation, of course, I don't, uh, you know, I use it myself in my life and I would encourage others to do so if that uh, suits them and it's appropriate for their mental health at that particular time. But, um, and journalists too, but, uh, you know, it's very difficult to um, find that sort of time available. But even if journalism students had just a little bit of training in that area, um, mini reflections or mini meditations um, at the point of perhaps being assigned a very important story. I mean, for years, um, workers took their smoking break, uh, you know, uh, their morning tea break or whatever. They stepped outside, they talked with colleagues, and I don't see much difference between a journalist finding a a quiet place even at their own desk and just simply pausing to reflect. And in my principles of mindful journalism, they reflect through those basic eightfold path uh, principles, things like, um, what understanding do I have of this situation? What is my intent here? Is this in accord with the livelihood that I have entered into? Um, what is my what are my proposed actions and where do they sit ethically? What speech or communication uh, is most appropriate to this situation? Um, can I reflect on this? Can I reflect um, in action? Um, what effort am I putting into this? And uh, how well concentrated or what what can I do to assist myself to be fully concentrated in the moment? And they are the steps of the Eightfold Path. And you can use those just in your ordinary life uh, as you encounter, um, you know, in your daily journey of ups and downs. 
Um, you can use them as a journalist in that professional ethical situation. And we can also use them as academics, as a way of, uh, as a schema for looking at a piece of uh, reporting that we're examining and asking whether it seems that those sorts of steps have been taken or how it might be done better if they were taken um, in that kind of story in the future. Yes. Are there, um, since you're a legal, uh, since you're a media law person, are, are there countries where you think a mindful press is more likely to evolve because of their particular speech laws? It's kind of a strange question, but I was just thinking about the, I was thinking about how, um, how far we are from that in the U.S. because under First Amendment laws, of course, so much of speech is, is protected hmm. um, and, and even uh, and valued. Uh, even when it goes, uh, you know, directly against some of these principles that you're talking about. Hmm. Well, it's, it's a very good point. Um, as I said, uh, for many, for more than ten years, I was the Australian correspondent for Reporters Without Borders. So I certainly value uh, free expression very highly. Um, I, I, I think I've changed a little to the extent that. Um, I'm more at the uh, responsible journalism end of the equation than the total libertarian, uh, free, uh, you know, publish and be damned uh, yeah. end where I think earlier in my career I might have tended more that way. Um, yeah. That said, I don't believe laws are the solution to these problems, and I think it's a slippery slope if we start um, uh, you know, passing laws of society that force people to be more mindful in their speech. Uh, <laughs> that would be a terrible thing. Uh, sure. So um, I, I think it, it calls, it, it needs to be much more a question of uh, civics, um, basic, um, uh, you know, ethical training, uh, starting at the youngest level, but certainly we have that as part of all respectable journalism courses. Um, and the problem seems to be uh, associated in some way with the ordinary um, citizens' use of social media when they haven't had this kind of um, education and uh, they are inclined to use social media as an uninformed soapbox and latch on to whoever agrees with them and not necessarily to use, um, you know, a, a civil form of, uh, of public speaking when talking about and to others. Yes. I think, uh, I think you would probably agree that, um, you know, true mindfulness in journalism probably requires somewhat of a mindful audience as well. Yes, well, we're finding audiences are, um, uh, you know, uh, becoming much more um, specialised and niche and focused on people they agree with. Um, but I wouldn't just say that, you know, mindful journalism should speak only to um, those who uh, show compassion for others and uh, of are of that uh, frame of mind, because mm -hmm. I, I think it there's the possibility for everybody to incorporate some of these values if they can see the benefit of it applying to others. So yeah. it's, um, it's really a case of, I mean, a fundamental question for uh, the school system would be, do we want a society where everybody's at each other's throats and uh, throwing all sorts of insults based on um, mistruths and rumour? I mean, what, what kind of schoolyard do we have when we allow that to happen? Uh, if we extend that to broader society, what measures can we take to uh, prevent that kind of schoolyard existing in broader society and internationally? Yes. Um what have your colleagues' reactions been uh, to your practice of mindful journalism? Are are they um, is this considered peculiar? Is it just because we're culturally so far removed? You know, when I mention this to American colleagues, there's no. It's sort of like, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, do Do you think it's more widely practiced where where you are? Is it pretty um, Is it pretty niche? Well, I think at this stage it is quite niche. Um, it's more within the academy and uh, within colleagues with whom I associate, those I speak with at conferences and so on. 
our National Journalism Education uh, Association, the uh, JIRA, the Journalism Education Research Association of Australia, um, hosted a mindfulness session for a colleague and me. I don't consider myself an expert in um, guiding meditations, um, and uh, but my colleague from the Australian branch of the DART Centre uh, for Journalism Trauma, um, Kate McMahon, led a, um, a couple of mini meditations meditation sessions, um, and in between, uh, I spoke about these principles of mindful journalism, and that was quite well attended. Uh, a lot of people were um, very positive about that, but you use the word peculiar. Um, because it's relatively new in the field, um, it comes, you know, essentially it's based in Eastern philosophies. Um, I think it's seen, um, you know, by some as perhaps a bit um, peculiar, a bit left of field, um, but uh, that said, there is a huge movement throughout Western societies towards uh, mindfulness at a secular level. And there's yes. some suspicion uh, about it, and that's because you have that phenomenon that became branded as uh, or became known as muck mindfulness because uh, uh, it seems that everyone's out to make a buck out of mindfulness in some way, <laughs> and uh, and those who follow Buddhism as um, you know as more of a religion um, are critical of it for that, and also yes. critical, and some psychologists and psychiatrists are critical of just anybody suddenly sitting down and meditating because there are all sorts of mental health issues some people might have that uh, they need to be talked through as part of any session. Um, but all of that said, there is this Western movement towards it and there's some um, scientific and medical uh, research uh, supporting it now. So I think it's becoming better known. And so uh, my plan is to work more closely with my colleagues from uh, DART uh, in, the, in the near future and start to explore the potential for better uh, journalism resilience um, uh, following some of these mindfulness uh, practices. So that's an that's a, um, area to explore. So I'm actually finding it useful um, at a number of levels in my own life, in my um, uh, training or uh, educating of, of students, in my analysis of material as a, as a journalism academic, and as its potential uh, actually in the newsroom for training of journalists and partly uh, because of this resilience factor. Yeah. Um, this isn't the kind of thing that's in the curriculum anywhere, and I, I know you teach ethics as well, but I think, uh, you know, a really mind, uh, a practice that really is geared toward this would have to, would have to spread across the curriculum, would you agree? You couldn't confine it to one class, necessarily. Um, can you... It, do you think there's a place for this now in the journalism curriculum? And if you if you had to implement it, how, how could you do that? How could well, we do that? Yeah, so within the short term, I don't see us all suddenly having courses or subjects called mindful journalism. Um, really, it's closely related to ethics uh, when we are talking through those ethical dimensions. And the work I've done has mainly been in the ethical area. I don't actually teach... Um, media ethics at my institution at the moment. Okay. I did at my previous institution. We have so many students where I am that I specialise in media law. Okay. But I've introduced it to media law. In fact, I've just written an academic article uh, about uh, its application to the teaching of media law students, mm -hmm. uh, working through some of those steps and uh, learning to uh, reflect mindfully upon a legal dilemma as it arises in a journalist's work, because it can be applied just as easy. After all, ethics and law are very, very closely related. Um, sure. It was only last year I was at the AEJMC uh, convention and there was a whole session devoted to the interface between law and ethics. So, um, and quite quite a lot of legal problems are in fact um, also ethical problems in the domain of privacy, um, um, you know, defamation, um, uh, confidentiality. Uh, these are all areas which, which have a uh, and, and copyright with plagiarism, of course. Uh, they have both legal and ethical uh, dimensions. So, uh, what has puzzled me in um, about thirty years of um, journalism education and about twenty years of teaching media law has been that I've been 
I'm still struggling for a way to be absolutely sure that students who graduate have a deep understanding of the areas, not just enough to pass an exam. And, yeah. and that's where I think um, mindful uh, reflection has an important role to play there because the, the knowledge part of it, you know, knowing what the elements of defamation are or knowing the, you know, the basic um, um, factors associated with copyright or something, uh, that can be covered by an exam, knowing the theory of that. But and so that that is to my mind that's important uh, for entrenching the language, so that yeah. if a situation arises, the journalist can um, identify. Well, here is a situation involving confidentiality, that may have ethical or legal implications. Let me now reflect upon my learning, and and that's where mindful journalism would kick in because they would then take some time out to reflect upon it. Uh, to work out whether they have the right understanding, whether they uh, their intent is uh, correct, and you know broader principles that are associated with Buddhism feed into this as well. Um, is my story going to um, help reduce suffering, uh, or is it going to increase it? Um, is there some way the story can show compassion or uh, find some solution rather than just cause more angst uh, and cause people to um, you know defend their own patch in more ways? So, so how can I build something into this story which actually shows some level of resolution? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just taking. Oh, no, that's okay. No problem at all. Mm. Um, that's interesting. I, I teach, uh, entrepreneurial journalism. Well, that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, a, it's very much a word that we're using in our course review at the moment because it, um, yeah. it's something that, um, uh, certainly, uh, academic administrators seem to like that word at the moment as well. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, what's been interesting to sort of watch the entrepreneurial landscape, um, are, there seem to there seem to be a lot more um, places that are practicing uh, solutions based journalism, yes. yeah. um, and I think that that's maybe uh, more along the lines of the kind of journalism that you're talking about that is more thoughtful and that is um, yes offering solutions as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, blowing up the problems disproportionately. Uh, very, very much so. And um, in my writing about this, I've drawn upon um, principles of peace journalism, um, solutions journalism, uh, uh, developmental journalism. Uh, there are a number of different journalisms, inclusive journalism. Uh, there are a number of these different things. But uh, I think together uh, they encourage a more mindful approach to our work, yeah. they're each chipping away at it in a in a in a different way, um, and I. But I don't think it's all or nothing. I mean, um, we have an enormous appetite for news in the general public out there, and I don't think, for example, uh, a niche publication that just produced um, solutions and positive news is uh, necessarily going to be a successful um, broader have a successful broader appeal. Um, but I think within mainstream media, there are opportunities for better follow-up stories, more diversity of sources, um, uh, stories that, um, you know, minimise the, the stress aspect and maximise the uh, solution and changes in people's lives and habits um, so that they might be a little bit more content in their lives. And that's not to say we shy away from important democratic and social change, uh, social justice issues. Um, I think Buddhism, for example, is often um, you know, misread as, uh, as a philosophy or a religion, which is just telling people to be happy with what they've got. And uh, yeah. it's not just about that. It's um, it's very much, if you look at the activities of the Dalai Lama, for example, you'll see there's a whole lot of activism for um, social change, for the betterment of, of everybody's lives. That's right. Yes. Yes. Mm. yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, would you uh, would you say uh, I'm sure you practice this in your classroom? Would you be able to give me some kind of an example um, of how you um, how you put the mindful journalism to practice uh, in a classroom setting? Okay, well, um, what I'll give you is I've just um, spent three years just finished with a project uh, with a team from my university, which was funded by the Commonwealth Government, um, the Australian Government, um, called Reporting Islam, uh, which was developing resources for a more mindful uh, reportage of Islam. And um, that was um, a several hundred thousand dollar uh, project. And it involved um, developing and rolling out uh, training resources for both um, journalists and students. Um, Mindful journalism um, fed into that in a small way. Uh, So, for example, we developed a a schema uh, for um, better, you know, international best practice in reporting Islam, drawing upon a number of sources, including international studies from the US, Europe and the UK on the best practice area. But some of these basic mindful journalism principles crept in there uh, as well. They didn't just creep in, but because I was an investigator, we we put them in there as well. Um, And we came up with 30, um, 30 tips uh, for journalists and students when going into a story involving this area. We then, uh, in rolling out the training, we put these 30 to the journalists and students um, throughout Australia and some internationally, um, and we said reduce them down to 10. And um, of those 10, some of these ones crept in as well. So um, have I thought carefully about the story that I'm embarking upon? Um, and those sorts of, you know, they, were, they weren't couched in terms of right understanding, right speech. They were basically translated into mindful practice um, for the benefit of the, the students and, uh, and the working journalists. So that's just one example. In the classroom, I mean, in my media law class, they are introduced to the basic principles early on. Um, I think it's very important with students that we explain the problem and the problem in media law being what I just explained to you. How on earth are you going to avoid the situation that this young journalist was in when she went out in her early career and was charged with contempt of court because she damaged the fair trial of somebody? And that, that happened here last year. So how are you going to avoid that? Well, we need to be mindful in our practice. These are the basic principles. Now, how are we going to work through a media law problem um, thinking about those things and how are we going to know when the alarm bells are ringing and um, you know when to call for legal advice or when we can revert, um, resort to our own knowledge and top that up um, so that we act both mindfully and legally in this new journalism situation. I, it would seem to me that legally it's a bit easier to kind of give pause and uh, think about those situations then on a, and, and you mentioned this before, when you're in a really deadline driven environment and you're not so much dealing with legal issues as you are with, um, you know, revenue issues uh, and speed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think yes. it, there's, there's still a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a clash there in the principles. No, I, I don't believe there's a clash. I think there's a lack of preparation and training on the part of, of some people. We all know that, um, I mean, the, the the final of the eight uh, steps of the um, eightfold path is what's called right concentration. And that is what I equate to like the um, master sports person or the classical pianist being in the zone. It just all comes together naturally in the moment. Um, And I believe that if one has entrenched these basic approaches, it happens that way as a matter of course, because they have been become so adept at thinking through these other steps in the less tumultuous times. 
in the story uh, about the fire brigade rescuing the cat from the tree, if they, uh, in their early stages of their suburban reporting, if they think through those principles there in the student assignments, it starts to get built in. So it becomes something that they're not thinking, oh, what is step number three in the eightfold path in the midst of some big breaking story? They are just doing it because it's second nature. It's what they see as the way the mindful or the master journalist uh, undertakes their work. So I certainly wouldn't, um, you know, wouldn't dismiss it uh, from you know the the war correspondent situation, uh, the uh, you know the unfolding disaster, um, you know, or the political crisis. It's it's really a matter of what preparation, what um, right effort and understanding has gone into it uh, before you know in in the weeks and years prior to that story. Yeah, the preparation is an interesting aspect because um, I don't know what your I, I have been to Australia once, but I was there as a tourist and a visitor, so I don't think I consumed a lot of news. Uh, I'm sure you know in the U.S. the media environment is pretty frenetic. Um, and the preparation aspect just seems, um, you know, we have all of these 24-hour um, news cycles, and I wonder if you think that, that uh, you know, a little bit more mindful journalism would also lead to a little bit less content. Yes, well... Yeah, maybe there's not a no, no. possibly not a need for um, everything that's being said right now. Hmm. Well, I think the problem with that is that we have access to everything now, and I wouldn't want to see that access reduced. Um, just as we have access to a an array of. Um, foods, uh, uh, liquids, um, legalized drugs, um, we can engage in that banquet uh, to our ultimate uh, ill health. And uh, it's the same for audiences. They can engage, they can be news junkies uh, to the extent of um, of watching car accidents, uh, court cases, um, all of that um, uh, news as it happens material. And I would suggest that it um, it may well be detrimental to their mental health to be so addicted to the news. What I think the answer is, is models of journalism, and we have these with various forms of long form and funded journalism, and some of the um, mainstream media have specialised in this over the years, long form journalism where um, the audience gets to choose the material that they will engage with more extensively. And I, I think that's the answer, rather than saying we will only have so many news stories in a, in a single day. You can create news stories that um, entice people into the long form journalism, um, but I think we can create, we can invent new ways of doing that. Um, but, you know, if, if it is a news model based around car accidents, for example, then the long form and mindful journalism can sit behind that. You know, um, all that would take would be a, a hyperlink or a button that is along the lines of, um, you know, solutions to this mess. Um, have your say with the legislators. Um, um, sick of these accidents, um, you know, what, what um, join the debate on what to do about it. And that then becomes a mindful extension to it. In the cut and thrust of a very busy newsroom, um, there may never be a moment for that reflection. But every journalist has to get to work somehow, and they have to get home. And in that journey to work and to and, and home, they have the opportunity to reflect upon what's ahead of them, what their intent is with the day, and what understanding they have. Um, and on the journey home, they get to ch the chance to reflect on how they might have done that better. And the mindful journalism um, scaffolding allows for that self-analysis so that the next day, uh, the next story, one of those stories the next day might be slightly more mindful than it was the day prior.
maybe you just created a new um, entrepreneurial model there. Uh, well, I'm, uh, well, I'm getting too advanced <laughs> in my career to uh, uh, to capitalize too much on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's that's really all I had. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I no, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, for the purposes of my recording, is just what um, got you interested in this and what parts of your uh, career um, intersect with mindful journalism to any extent? Up to this point, really uh, nothing. I, mm -hmm. like you, have been interested in uh, mindfulness and not really, I wouldn't even go so far as to call myself a, a Buddhist. I'm not familiar enough with any of the tenets. I didn't encounter that with respect to my profession until I found your, until I found your writings. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been interested in mindfulness and have uh, tried to practice it in some form also in secular fashion for uh, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was in listening to, um, I, you're probably familiar with Eckhart Tolle. Mm, yes. Yeah. Mm. And it was in listening to him speak once. Uh, and he, at the opening of his speech was talking about the problems of the mass media. Mm. Um, and, and that was it for me. I kind mm. of started thinking about, my gosh, we need to start talking about this in our profession. Yes, um, I agree with that. Because yeah. we're we're really part of a big problem rather than part of a solution when when we should be problem solving um, in our jobs. And um, I used to work for Bloomberg News. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently uh, found I haven't been there since two thousand nine, um, but one of my former colleagues told me they actually do uh, do some mindfulness practice um, for the journalists there. Oh, good. Um, mm in how they present their stories. And I've always had a lot of respect for how that organization presented stories. It was never uh, to glamorize or to sensationalize. Um, and so, you know, now the media environment here is, uh, it's insane, quite frankly. Uh, and it's really hard to teach students in this environment. And so as soon as I heard Eckhart Tolle start talking about that, I thought, wow, this is something that really needs to um, have a light shone on it. Uh, so I went and started doing my research, and I found you. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, well, um, well so welcome hope, aboard. Welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah. hope is to yeah. – I don't see how you cannot start incorporating this into your daily practice and into your teaching once you're aware of it. Mm. Um, I don't mm. really know what that looks like for me mm. yet. I just mm. know that I'm interested in starting to write, even if it's in a, um, a more, um, a more general way as opposed to an academic way. I'm not really an academician. I'm a lecturer. Yes. So um, mm. my interest would be to, you know, to publish about this uh, somewhere like Pointer Institute or uh, Media Shift somewhere where journalism educators might read it um, and, and take take heed a little bit. And I think that's a very valuable role. I think we have to work to our strengths and our backgrounds and with your background yeah. in that area. And I think um, the academy or the that industry is starting to accommodate that much more rather than turning everybody into... Um, into scholars uh, publishing in um, yes. esoteric and uh, barely read journals. Uh, thankfully, many of those are now more available than they were in the past. So uh, that's probably yes. how you came across my work rather than um, if it had been 20 years ago, it would be buried in some journal somewhere that uh, was sitting in hard copy in a library. That's right. Well, the first thing I read of yours actually was the talk from 20, I think it was 2013. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. At, the, um, yeah. at the Pacific Media Centre. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. Oh, yes. great. All right. So, well, um, yeah, we'll keep in touch. It's great that you're interested in the area. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions or anything, uh, by all means, shoot me an email. And thanks for agreeing right. to for me to record the interview for the purposes of the blog. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for carving out the time, and um, I, I will uh, I will send you what I have when I have it. it. Okay, great. Well, nice to meet you, and good luck with the project. Likewise. Okay. Have a great day. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>